the topic of this lecture is about faith. I'm going to read a verse from Bhagavad Gita, which is on this this board here. And it's uh, Bhagavad Gita chapter 4, Transcendental Knowledge, text number 40. Ayas Jasradhanascha. Don't worry, for those who don't know Sanskrit, part of this is in English also. Samshayatma Vinashiti. Nanyam Lokostina Paro. Nasukam Samshayatmanaha. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not attain God consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. In Shukhar's purport, out of the many standard and authoritative revealed scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita is the best. Persons who are almost like animals have no faith in or knowledge of the standard revealed scriptures. And some, even though they have knowledge of or can cite passages from the revealed scriptures, have actually no faith in these words. And even though others may have faith in the scriptures, like Bhagavad Gita, they do not believe in or worship the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Such persons cannot have any standing in Krishna consciousness. They fall down. Out of all the above-mentioned persons, those who have no faith and are always doubtful make no progress at all. Men without faith in God and His revealed world, word find no good, world, good in this world nor in the next. For them there is no happiness whatsoever. One should therefore follow the principles of revealed scriptures with faith and thereby raised, be raised to the platform of knowledge. Only this knowledge will help one become promoted to the transcendental platform of spiritual understanding. In other words, doubtful persons have no status whatsoever in spiritual emancipation. One should therefore follow in the footsteps of greater charyas who are in the disciples' succession and thereby attain success. So the verse again, Agas Shastradhanas Cha Samshayatma Vinashiti but ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not attain God consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. Namaste Saraswatunde Ve Gauravani Pacharne Nirvishe Shashunivadi Paskatya De Siddharne. Generally it's quite unusual for people to declare that they have faith in, in scripture. Most people who Identify people that have faith in scripture. They identify themselves. They identify such persons as religious fanatics. But actually, scripture is not meant for religious fanatics. Uh, scripture is actually science. As I said, Shri Prabhupada was giving a lecture in Durban, South Africa. Not a lecture, it was part of a seminar. There was a whole variety of speakers, and Prabhupada was one of the speakers. And one of the other speakers was an Indian gentleman, and this Indian gentleman happened to be a Christian. And when Prabhupada said, or explained about transmigration of the soul, in the middle of his explanation, this Indian gentleman objected. Swamiji, why are you talking about this, dar- this Hindu dharma? Or dogma, actually dogma. Everyone knows what dog, dogma means? You know what dogma means? Dogma means to have a dog. No. 
<laughs> it means some kind of philosophy which is probably just made it, created out of sentiment, but people fanatically, stubbornly, without ability to reason or to try to understand, just uh, stick to it without any op uh, possibility of changing. Is blind following. As Robert writes in the Bhagavad Gita, blind following and absurd inquiries are condemned. So blind following. You have no idea, you have no experience, you have no realization whether it's true or not, but you just follow it blindly because it's what your parents or your relatives or your friend, whatever, tells you that that's what you're supposed to do. It's like one priest. He had a cat, but he used to do these fire sacrifices. But he didn't know what to do with the cat, so every time he did a fire sacrifice, he tied the cat to a post near the fire sacrifice. So his students observed this very carefully, and later on when this priest left, then every time they do a fire sacrifice, they'd buy a cat and tie it to, the, near, to a post near the fire sacrifice. They didn't know why, but they figured that without the cat, the fire sacrifice wouldn't be successful. <laughs> so that's called blind following. They never bothered to ask the priest, why, why are you tying a cat to the near the fire sacrifice? But they blindly follow it. And a certain inquiries means to, our focus in Krishna consciousness is has a purpose. In other words, our philosophy is very, very simple. We only want three things. Does anyone know what the three things we want? We're only looking for three things. We, we don't need four, just like Ramana Dave. He only wanted three steps. So we're very simple and humble. We only want three things. If the genie came, say you had a, a, a lamp and you rubbed it, and the genie came out, we'd only ask for three things. Because we have our bead bags, and I said we, every day we rub this bead bag, Oh, Krishna, Krishna, and the bead bag, please grant me my wishes. <laughs> but we have to know what wishes we want. So do you know what three wishes we want? Anyone? To obtain what? Or, what's that? Go home to Krishna. Go home. Okay. What would we do when we're home? <laughs> Go, go look in the refrigerator and see what's in there. What would we do? What are we looking for? Why do we want to go home? Any, I won't leave you in suspense any longer. We only want three things. We want knowledge. We want knowledge of how to be ha as happy as possible for as long as possible. Actually, we want to be happy forever. We want perfect knowledge of how to become happy, blissful forever. Now, anything outside of that is considered a waste of time. If, in other words, if you're trying to find out something that actually won't make you happy forever, then you're just wasting, we're wasting our time. So therefore, blind following, just doing things ritualistically without any understanding of what we're trying to achieve, and absurd inquiries, inquiries that will not really give us permanent happiness. We're inquiring, we want knowledge, but so many people are inquiring, what's the price of stocks? What's the price of the of rice? What's the, what, what's the best movie? Now, even you go to the best movie, I can guarantee you, unless it's a Christian conscious movie like Avatar or something like that, <laughs> you probably won't find permanent happiness. Uh, we, we're not recommending Avatar. We're Christian Avatar, that's the only Avatar we recommend. But <laughs> unless we know actually what the goal is, we won't be able to achieve it. Now, blind following means we're faithful for something, but we don't know what actually the goal is. We don't know what we're trying to achieve. We don't know what the purpose is. We're faithful to something. Everyone has some faith. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Sadva Nurupa Sarvasha, Shranad Bhavati Bharata, Sharaomayo Yo Purusha, 
Yoyetz Charas Evasaha. That according to one's modes of nature, one is situated under, one evolves a particular kind of faith. In other words, as I said, Krishna conscious philosophy has bliss, knowledge, and eternity, but it actually has only three other things. Namely, that we're not this body. We're eternal spiritual beings, each one of us. Even the people I don't like, they're spiritual beings, somehow or another. Even the people we don't like, they're all eternal, they're all spiritual, and that there's a supreme spiritual being. Even we don't want him to become God or be God, even we have an election and we vote him out of office, it doesn't make any difference. He's still God. There's nothing we can do about it. We can write letters of protest. We can go to Vrindavan and protest. <laughs> but it's not going to help. It's not going to change anything. The person who's controlling this universe, he's controlling every atom. He's causing everything to change here at every moment. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. We can't look at, you know, my finger. Don't change. I refuse. Don't change. I'm telling you not to change. Listen, listen to me. <laughs> It has no effect whatsoever. That means that there is some intelligent person who's actually changing everything in this universe, and it's not us. At least I can guarantee it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time one person said, we, we gave this philosophy, said, well, I, I'm actually controlling the sun and the moon. Wow, <laughs> that's really amazing. Could you do me a favor? It's a little cold right now. Could you change the temperature? And his answer was, yes, I could, but I don't want to. <laughs> what do you want to do? That I don't want to tell you. It's all going on by my mercy, but I don't want to do anything. Thank you. <laughs> As one, do, one person came to Prabhupada one time and said, Swamiji, this is in the year in 60. 69, I thought he said, Swamiji, I'm God, I'm controlling everything. So Prabhupada said, my basis is God, please leave. <laughs> <laughs> so our philosophy is that there is a God and it's not us. Sorry. And we're eternal, but we have an eternal relationship with that Supreme Person. And the idea of life, the idea of human life especially, is to become conscious of that relationship, to actually meet the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Not just to hear about Him, but actually meet Him face to face and even talk with Him, play with Him, dance with Him, eat with Him. Those who don't believe in that, they'll believe something else. In other words, everyone has faith in something, they want to meet something, they want to experience something. And at modern advertisement is, you know, go to the movies and meet this, this movie or go to the sports game and meet, meet the sports game. we we'll go to this political rally and meet this politician. Everyone wants to experience something in this world. And according to their knowledge of what their possibilities of experience are, that's what they're engaging their existence in, to try to experience something. And according to what they're experiencing, then they'll change their mode of material nature. If you stay up at night and you watch a movie, then you'll enter in eventually into the mode of ignorance and you'll sleep all day the next day. So if we watch, if we don't, if we watch something in ignorance, then we become ignorant. If we watch something in passion, then we become passion. We associate with something in goodness, eventually we become good. But there's some, something called transcendental. Now, how do we know it's transcendental? Because that takes some knowledge. And here it says that knowledge, is, well, knowledge is, first of all, knowledge in scripture. Why scripture? What is scripture? Is it some book that everyone weighs in the hand? You know, I'm the truth, the light. No one comes to, you know, whatever, except through me. What is scripture? Scripture is simply knowledge that we're not this body. The whole purpose of scripture is to give us, to convince us that our bodies are changing, but we're not changing. We're all eternal. And that there's a process you can follow 
that's called yoga, by which we can become detached from our material conception and realize that we're not this body. Very simple. That's through hearing and austerity and controlling the life eras, etc. One can change one's consciousness and we realize that one is not the body. And that's done through Varnashram, which is regulating one's existence, detaching oneself from sense gratification, and performing sacrifice for some for a higher cause, etc. And the other thing is that there is a God. That's and it's not us, the God Krishna, or God, whoever you want to call him, Jehovah, Yahweh. He's controlling the whole universe. And he's also in our heart, giving us remembrance giving us forgetfulness, giving us knowledge, that there is actually a person controlling this universe and controlling us also. And that there's a method that we can become conscious of that person and of our relation with that person and act in that relationship with that person. And that person is all attractive. He's the source of everything. So he has unlimited beauty, unlimited knowledge, unlimited strength, unlimited fame, unlimited renunciation, unlimited uh, wealth. Now, we can't see that person right now, clearly at least. We don't know if he's the strongest. He hasn't participated in any Olympics that I know of. We don't know if he's the most beautiful, because I I couldn't give you a snapshot of Krishna 5,000 years ago. Here's the picture, here's the proof. Ah, my God. Yeah, I want to meet that person. He's really nice. We can't show a picture. Or we can't. You can ask Krishna for a loan, but I don't think he could show you his whole treasury. So we can't convince you, anyone that Krishna is the wealthiest. But Krishna happened to speak Bhagavad Gita. So we hear Bhagavad Gita. We can understand if he was the most intelligent because of his words are perfect. If he spoke this book 5,000 years ago, and the knowledge is just as perfect now as it was 5,000 years ago, and it'll apply for 5 million years from now, then obviously this person has the best knowledge that we know of. And that's Bhagavad Gita. But we can't know if Bhagavad Gita is true or not unless we study it. And then again, we have to find out what actually Bhagavad Gita is all about. So again, Scripture... Bhagavad Gita is only about three things. Everything else is simply assistance for those three things. Namely, to realize that we're eternal, to meet the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and the method of doing that. Everything else is simply to assist those three things. Now, someone knows nothing about Scripture. One doesn't believe in Scripture at all. They think it's simply for sentimental fanatics. Then, of course, they won't know about those three things. Namely, that we're eternal, that there's a Supreme Person, he spoke Bhagavad Gita, and he told us how we can get to know him and meet him. So such a person, he believes he's the body, he believes that there is no God, he believes that there's no spiritual process worth following, and therefore the only thing he's involved in is more or less the same thing that the lower animals, the animals engage in, namely eating, sleeping, mating, defending. Now, eating, sleeping, made, and defending, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's something higher than that, namely spiritual knowledge. But if we just limit ourselves to those four activities, then those are the four activities that all living entities in this universe are engaged in. There's nothing higher. Now, someone may come in contact with Bhagavad Gita, and they may appreciate it. They even may memorize it. They may be able to repeat it. It's like when I was in Dallas, Texas, 1975. We had a school there, which is called a Gurukul. And there were many students, and Shula Prabhupada used to visit. He visited around five times. And one time he was visiting. I was there also because I was, I was temple president there twice, and I was president of two other temples there one, twice, one of them twice. It was a kind of like a what do they call them? Musical chairs. So I was one of the temple presidents for playing musical chairs there. But every time I got the chance to stay with Prabhupada and talk with him and be with him when he was there. 
And one time I was there, they had they presented two Gurukul students. One was one was called one was named Krishna Smarna. At that time, prasadam was quite simple, too simple. But every Sunday they had a big feast, amazing feast. You can't believe, you know, it was really a. They had always had malpours, if you know what those are, and glovedemins and samosas, and they didn't have pizza though. They didn't have a pizza oven back then. <laughs> Anyhow, it was a very elaborate Sunday feast, and every day the maha was very nice. They had beautiful deities, Radha Kala Chandri, and it was very nice. But no one got to, only few people got to eat the maha. But they had a contest. Anyone who could re- recite a chapter of the Bhagavad Gita would get the maha that day. <laughs> the trick was that you had, if you got the maha the first week, then the second week that who, the, you had to recite not only the first chapter, but the second chapter also to get the maha. So in 18 days, it became a challenge to get the maha. But there were devotees, there were Gurukul students who memorized the whole 18 chapters, mostly because they were really hungry. <laughs> when Prabhupada came, he was sitting on his Vyasasan, and Leela Smarana and this other devotee, which I don't remember his name, he came up to Prabhupada and they said, you know, Prabhupada, they know the Bhagavad Gita, they could recite it. So Leela Krishna Smarana was reciting, you know, Dharma Shetre Kuru Shetre Sama Vedi Yutsavaha Mame Kam Badavais Jaiva Kima Kurva Sanjaya. And he went on for, you know, five minutes and it was, you know, the Denos Minyadade. And then Prabhupada said, Oh, very nice. He said, Can you tell me the translation? And Leela Smarana looked at him and said, what? Translation? We don't get a maha for, we don't get the maha for telling the translation. It's only for the Sanskrit. You don't understand Brahma. So Brahma said, you don't know the translation? He said, no, no, we have no idea what trans- translate. What does translation mean? So Brahma said, useless. It has no meaning. You know, you're just like a parrot. You just a parrot, we could have a parrot here. Because I don't know if they'd give the parrot the maha plate, but he could also chant like you are. So then I realized, oh, I have to also learn the English or some language. So blind following and absurd inquiries are condemned. One should not only hear submissively, but one should get a clear understanding through submission, service, and inquiry. So in other words, someone may be able to recite the Bhagavad Gita or any scripture like a parrot, but it has very little benefit. So that person also is also faithless because they don't know what the purpose of scripture is. Krishna didn't speak our, to Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna and at the end asked him, have you heard this with perfect attention? And Arjuna replies, yes. Sanjaya Vacha, <laughs> Dharma Shetra, Kuru Shetra. So, oh, very good, Arjuna. <laughs> now that you can recite Bhagavad Gita like a parrot, now what are you going to do? I'm going to go home <laughs> and learn Shemad Bhagavatam. So long, Krishna. Good luck with the fight. No, yes, Arjuna, have you actually heard this with attention? Is your illusion destroyed? And are you prepared to act according to my instructions? So Krishna was expecting Arjuna not only to learn Bhagavad Gita, but to act according to it. And then Prabhupada says, it's a third class of persons they actually learn the Bhagavad Gita. They learn the scriptures like Bhagavad Gita. They can recite it. They remember it. They can even apply it in their lives, but they don't know what the purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to get to know Krishna. It's not to become rich or famous. It's not to become austere. It's not to become renounced. It's to become Krishna conscious. They should, we should know that the object is Krishna to develop awareness of and love for Krishna. That Bhagavad Gita is actually Krishna talking personally to us so that we can know what he wants. And when we apply that in our lives, then the result is he reveals himself to us. And when Krishna reveals himself to us, then we gain experience called Krishna consciousness. 
And that's how our faith grows. It's by actually experiencing Krishna. And Krishna means to experience the bliss of Krishna consciousness because Krishna is unlimited le- reservoir of love and pleasure. We can tell if we're in Krishna consciousness because we're experiencing more and more transcendental pleasure. Pleasure which is unimaginable, inexplicable by any m- mundane experience. Therefore, there are different stages of experiencing that pleasure. But one of the first is at what's called sadhana bhakti in the state of p- practice. That happiness that we can experience in Krishna consciousness by becoming aware of Krishna is greater than any material happiness. And at a progressive stages, at the stage of bhava, then that happiness derives even the conception of liberation, of becoming completely free from any material conception of life. And on the highest stage, the happiness is so intense that one is not even aware of material existence anymore. Everything appears to be beautiful and ecstatic and blissful and lovable. So that's the aim of by hearing from Krishna, him speaking personally to us, so that we apply it within our lives, in our relationships with others, then the result is Krishna reveals himself and then we become faithful because we've got faithful because we have the experience. Whatever we experience, that's what our faith really lies. And when we experience something nice, then we want to put our attention into that object even more and then our experience in that object will grow. So in Krishna consciousness, if we develop, we actually get some happiness by chanting Hare Krishna or by hearing Shrimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, or by worshiping the deities, or by serving the devotees, or by trying to make the atmosphere spiritual, either in the temple or outside by offering Krishna consciousness to others, then the result is that we want to do it some more. We develop attraction, and that's called tatra loyam muyam ekalam. That, that turns into greed. It becomes so nice that we can't live without it, just like a fish cannot live with outside of water. So that's what we're aiming for. And that's possible by hearing from Scripture and understanding what Scripture is meant for. So we just don't read it like a parrot. We don't read it without any attention. You know, I don't understand this. This makes no sense. This isn't a language I don't understand. You know, what is, you know, who cares about you, Yusava, or Dhritarashtra, or these other people? What is this all about? No, we should understand from the beginning it's meant to develop our conscious, our spiritual consciousness. And we should take from Scripture whatever we can to apply what we can apply within our lives and especially in our relationships with others so that they become more spiritualized. That we see others as Krishna servants rather than as objects of our exploitation. We see the process of uniting with Krishna is the same for everyone. We can sit down with our family morning and evening and chant Hare Krishna together. There's no impediment for that. And we can sit down and hear a little bit about Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, so that in our relationships with husband and wife and children, they can become a little bit more conscious that in that relationship, they're the servants of Krishna's servants and therefore act as a servant of their family members rather than as an exploiter of their family members. And they can worship the deity. They can have the deity, even a picture of the deity in their house, and make the deity the object of their worship, of their attention, of their cooperation, that they could see their family as part of a spiritual family, and that the actual father of the family is Krishna, the actual mother of the family is Shemati Rarani, and everyone else is their children trying to cooperate with each other in order to serve their father and mother, Shemati Rarani and Krishna. In that way, Prabhupada said, in the material world, we can never expect complete happiness, nor can we expect complete misery. But if we're in Krishna consciousness, then there'll be the maximum of happiness and the minimum of misery. So that faith we have to have. Then we can advance in Krishna consciousness. So thank you. Hare Krishna. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. You always nicely explain this process of how consciousness develops. Um, <clears throat> um, what
what about how would you explain uh, the mindset when at the beginning a person doesn't have experience of Krishna um, or any spiritual um, experience so and no faith also so um, how would you motivate and explain that uh, this faith which is um, put it into so-called uh, stories of Krishna and um, and the soul and so on. Um, I, w- I mean, um, I mean to say that this faith is also blind. It's like um, you put blindly you put faith into something. So how would you? Well, I, we try not to put blindly faith into something. In other words, even at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada said, you don't have to accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, nor do you have to deny he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You should just take as a premise that Krishna is speaking as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Let's see what he has to say, if what he's saying actually makes any sense. And if he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he'll probably have something valuable to tell me. We don't have to blindly accept that he is, and we don't have to blindly accept that he isn't. But we should find out what he's saying, so we can see if it has some merit in our lives, that's all. Similarly, in the other stories about Krishna, we don't have to blindly accept them, we don't have to blindly reject them. For the most part, they really have little bearing on what we're doing in our life. For those who have become more advanced, they may have, one may be able to see the, the meaning behind them that's applicable for a advan- more advanced devotee, but for a new devotee, they're not really that relevant in terms of the lessons that one can learn to help one's practical life in Krishna consciousness, to advance in spiritual life. But we don't have to blindly accept them. We don't have to blindly reject them either. They're beyond our capacity to understand. That we should understand. And stay stick with the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, nectar devotion, things that we can actually apply practically in our lives so that we can get what's promised, namely that if we understand the process correctly, then Krishna may reveal this knowledge to us and it becomes experienced knowledge. So that we have to do, see what we can practically do with our present body, mind, and words, so that we can get some mercy from Krishna and see if not, if Krishna doesn't, if Krishna can give us mercy, so that these basic things we can realize more and more, like we're not this body, for instance, or that there is a God. Those are the two important things. That's what Bhagavad Gita deals with, for instance. So like steps before the step. Well, those are the steps. If we realize we're not this body, we're doing quite well. <laughs> if we realize that Krishna is God, then everything else will be very simple. So these are not these are the steps. When we chant Hare Krishna, which is open for everyone, this is the best step. Even the spiritual world, it's the best prayer. So here is the best prayer also. But we should at the beginning we we're chanting Hare Krishna, it's you know something like Hare Krishna. It's not exactly. At the end it'll actually be really Hare Krishna. Anything else? Okay, there's a question. Okay. Um, could I just ask you for advice? Um, if we are in contact with the philosophical system that is not completely compatible with Krishna consciousness, could you advise how to um, how to minimize the um, the impact of that philosophical system on the faith in Krishna consciousness? Well, it depends what the system is. Um, so, for, exa- for example, if, if I, I know if I, I would give a um, concrete example, for example, um, so for example, um, if you come to encounter with someone who likes, say, Bible philosophical system and then he wants to talk to you, for example. So, um, which, which philosophical um, system? For example, Sai Baba's philosophical Sai system. Sai Baba. Yeah, and then you don't, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and I know if you are, the, for m- more hours with in contact with person and then he's talking to you for example should we try to um, compare it with Krishna consciousness or should no just uh, if, if the members of Sai Baba just ask him for some gold <laughs> 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 a 
I said, I think a man who has some gold and we'll give them a book in for exchange. <laughs> <laughs> well, we generally don't try to get into philosophical arguments with people because we're just wasting our time, especially if we don't know the person. And if we do know them, it's even less likely they're going to accept what we have to say. <laughs> So generally, we try to find out where we're in agreement, at least at first, unless there's other people present who are, you know, interested in our philosophy and the person's challenging us, then we may express or debate with them. But otherwise, debating, usually, most people, if they lose the debate, they don't surrender, they become more angry. And they hate you more than they hated you at the beginning. So nothing really has been accomplished in terms of love and devotion. It's not that you defeat them. They say, oh, sadhu, let me surrender to you, your feet, you know. No, they think, you rascal. I'm trying, I was going to punch you, but I'm trying. <laughs> they don't want to be defeated. They want to be appreciated for the, how wonderful they are, how wonderful the people they worship are. Okay, one more question. What is real spiritual life? Real spiritual life is, the, first of all, begins with gaining some knowledge that we're not this body and understanding what the process is of realizing that we're not this body and who we actually are and who, we're, who everyone else is and who the person who's controlling everything is. So that practice by which we realize who we are, who everyone else is, and who the Supreme Person is, the greatest person, that's spiritual practice. All right, thank you very much. Gradhara Shimad Bhagavad Gita Kijai. Shila Prabhupada Kijai. Gaur Pimananda.